everyone. Welcome to our fourth Candid Critters live webinar question and answer session. Um, welcome. We want to welcome all of you, um, all of our past volunteers, and um, anyone who's just tuning in to get a little bit more information about the project before joining. I'm Arielle Parsons. I'm Lexi Mash. And we like to do these uh, question and answer sessions at the beginning of each camera trapping season so that we can get you all started off on the right foot, um, kind of remind you of some of the uh, finer points of the online training that you might have forgotten, and also give you the chance, of course, to ask the questions so that we can answer them live uh, during the session. So feel free at any time to write in questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. Mm -hmm. So as you can probably tell by the weather, uh, the uh, winter season is coming to a rapid close, and the spring season uh, of camera trapping is upon us. So we hope, of course, that the weather stays pretty nice for you all to, uh, <laughs> to put out your cameras. It's been pretty great so far. Um, and so before we launch into some reminders that we'd like to give you for that spring season to prepare you, we're going to, of course, look at some of our uh, best and favorite pictures from the winter season. Let's do it. Let's see what we got. Oh, okay. Well, this is, as Lexi knows, and you all will probably learn, this is one of my favorite all-time species, the raccoon. Yes, this I raccoon see. was found in Cleveland County. Oh, okay. Yeah, so he uh, looks like he was caught doing something that he probably shouldn't have been doing. I find usually for raccoons that is the case, that they have been caught doing <laughs> something that they shouldn't have been he doing. He kind of has this paw of like he caught, caught red-handed yeah. doing something. I so. think he did get caught. And I find that, you know, raccoons, as we all know, they're troublemakers. And I think that they live fairly guilt-free oh. with that fact. Mm -hmm. um, but this guy definitely looks like a very, very healthy, you know, he's, I, he's a pretty chubby. He's pleasantly plump. He is a pleasantly plump raccoon. <laughs> That's a great picture. <laughs> oh, this is, oh, this is a great picture. Um, so this is a coyote. Where is this one from? This guy is from Rowan County. Oh, great. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I really like about coyote pictures is that there usually is quite a lot of variation in, uh, you know, their coat color and the pattern and kind of the, the I feel like their faces are often um, have a, a lot of variation. This guy, uh, and I have no data to back this up, but he looks kind of like an older, an older, more experienced coyote to me. Yeah. And as some of you know who might have been reading through the material that we have on our website, we are very interested in coyotes around the state. They're relatively recent arrivals, especially to the more suburban areas around the state. And so we're especially interested in seeing, you know, what sorts of um, information we can gather through this camera trapping effort about coyotes. And we're interested in all species, but we're, we're also very excited when we see the coyotes. Yeah, and you know what's really neat about this one is that coyotes seem to kind of flee from cameras. I'm not... I think they're a little bit more skittish, very and, this, shy. and this guy seems pretty brave. He's coming up and really investigating the camera. And, and that actually reminds me um, of, there was a, a research article many years ago that looked at um, coyotes and uh, kind of how dominant they were. So coyotes are, are similar to wolves. They do tend to run in packs, though not as often as wolves do, and so they have a, a dominance hierarchy. And they found that the more dominant individuals were, were more likely to approach a, a strange item like oh. a camera trap, whereas the more subordinate individuals were more likely to flee. So that, you know, that's not necessarily what's happening here, but it, it could be. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting. That is interesting. So if we move on to this guy. Oh, I love this guy. I love this picture. He's so majestic. He it's, is handsome. Yeah. Not that we know that it is a male. We don't, and I apologize because I do tend to call random animals he. I'm not sure why, um, but we have no idea whether this is a male or a female. But we do know it's a gray fox, mm -hmm. so uh, we've got that. Um, and I just think he's beautiful. And, you know, the thing that I love and a lot of people love about gray foxes is, is they're just proud and, like, bushy, like, beautiful tails. And right. this guy is really showing it off. This picture is pretty uh, idyllic, I think. Against the water, he yeah, looks right. like he he's has surveying, little pose there. Surveying mm -hmm. his domain. I like it. It's beautiful. Oh, so this is one of those rare uh, species uh, species interactions that we really we don't get a lot of these on the camera so whenever we do get these it's, it's especially exciting um, so this is a gray fox and a white-tailed deer um, and you can see there you know there's really no reason why uh, a gray fox would be scared of a white-tailed deer or a white-tailed deer would be scared uh, of a gray fox they you know gray fox are not really going to um, prey upon white-tailed deer so you know they seem like 
they're wary mm -hmm. of each other. They're acknowledging each other. They're very aware. Yes. They're aware, yeah. They're staring each other down. They're, they're there. having a little staring contest, <laughs> but, but probably not out of fear, maybe just a little out of uh, caution. Yeah, and, you know, learning kind of a, a little bit more about the interactions between species like this, which we really, you know, no one has really researched the interaction between mm. gray fox and uh, and uh, uh, white-tailed deer. So, you know, that's something that if we get enough interactions like this with our data, we could s study that a little bit. Which that could would be, be cool. really neat. Yeah. Oh, this, oh, is another little animal interaction there. If you guys see, so we've got the raccoon in the foreground and the, what we're calling the mystery canid in the background. Lexi and I have not decided that we agree on what that canid is. It's between a gray fox and a coyote. I mean, it's either or, it's not, you know, both. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, this is another interesting interaction. So, you know, the, it's unclear if the raccoon realizes that the canid is back there. Right. He kind of like sniffs the air mm -hmm. at that moment. And so maybe he's getting, you know, a little bit of an inkling that there was something over there, but they're really just going their separate ways. Right. And it's just neat to see that the, the camera is capturing these two different species within seconds of each other. Even if they're not really having a direct interaction with each other, it's always really fun to see that multiple species are being captured in the same sequence. And, you know, for us, when we go as scientists and we look at these data, um, we'll see kind of where different species are passing by and, and the, the habitats that they might both be using. And this could just be a wonderful area for both of those species, um, right. you know. And in fact, uh, you know, whether it's a gray fox or a coyote, they have a very similar diet to a, a raccoon. And so, you know, they could be looking at the same, same sort, for the same sorts of places to hang out. Right, and so any of you Candid Critters volunteers who are now pros at identifying gray foxes <laughs> and coyotes, you can kind of chime in you maybe on our, our Facebook <laughs> um, and let us know what you think it is. Yeah. Um, and we'll try to, to confirm that for you uh, at a later date. Yeah, yeah, the battle of the canids. <laughs> So with the wrap of the winter season, uh, we just want to share with you what has been happening over the last three months. Um, so we have had over 120 active volunteers. Wow. It's really, really great. great. That means these volunteers have been moving cameras around, setting them, um, letting them run for three weeks, and uploading those images to us. And so um, within uh, those 120 active, or more, we've been able to collect data in over 50 counties. Wow, half of the state. That is amazing. That is amazing. And we just started. That, we, exactly. That's we great, guys. We just started, really and we're able to uh, survey more than half of the state at this point. And, and granted, we want to survey a lot more sites over the next three years, but this is a, an amazing start. Um, and so this is really uh, due in part to we have uh, some of our BYO or our bring your own camera, our camera owner volunteers who have been helping us run cameras in other parts of the state. Um, so not just the eastern areas um, before we were able to lend our cameras to the other part of the state. Um, and so with all of the collected effort of our, all of our volunteers, we've uh, been able to uh, upload over uh, around 75,000 images. That is amazing. It is amazing we are so great grateful to have such great volunteers like you thank you so much um, so within those images that were uh, sent to us this is kind of the breakdown of the species identification or species detections that we have seen so far so you can see very clearly first <laughs> and foremost that white-tailed deer and eastern gray squirrels were the most detected species on the images. They are the usual suspects. They're those the two. usual suspects and I'm sure that some of you are tired of looking at those white-tailed deer tails pass by or those little eastern gray squirrel heads pop up from the bottom of your camera um, but we did have almost 3,000 detections of each of those species alone. Wow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so if we That's take those out, we can kind of get a better idea of the, the spread of other species, some other really cool species, such as black bears. We had about two, almost 250, so 230 of those, and um, northern raccoons, which are really always the, a fun thing to look at. They're um, my favorites. Right. As I already <laughs> said. <laughs> Ariel loves raccoons. Um, but something that's really interesting, if you look here, you can see that reptile species has popped 
popped up. And we don't have the exact species listed because we are really focused on mammals, but it is really neat to see that reptiles were identified, that they were able to trigger the camera um, so we could identify them on, on the images. And we've kind of talked about this in the past, but these, these trail cameras are heat and motion sensitive. So if something um, is hotter than, than the environment around it, it will set off the camera. And so if those reptile species are sitting out in the sun for a period of time and then they move by the camera, they can trigger it and we can be able to see all of the wildlife that's really living in the area. So that's always a really neat thing. Um, so we know that the most common species were those white-tailed deer and those eastern gray squirrels. Uh, but the least common so far have been striped skunks and our, um, our swamp uh, rabbits. And um, I'm really looking forward to seeing some of those more co uh, uncommon species. Uh, so striped skunks and some spotted skunks will be really exciting to find out where they are exactly in our state. We don't have a lot of information of exact locations or distributions yet, um, so that will be really interesting as this project progresses. Um, and we're also really interested in finding out, and we don't have any of these detections so far, but of those feral hogs and some armadillos. Um, so feral hogs have um, been across our state and they kind of caused some damage. Um, so we want to be able to know exactly what they, uh, where they are located and to kind of help with management of those species. And also find out where those armadillos are creeping up into our state and be able to really get a, a good idea of where they're existing at this point. Yeah, and we have a, a really cool blog post on uh, emammal.org if you're interested in, at all in, uh, in armadillos. And this is a natural range expansion, which is kind mm -hmm. of cool. And mm -hmm. they've just kind of started creeping into North Carolina, as Lexi said. And, you know, you reminded me when you were talking about those, um, those reptile species, I had a manager from um, Croatan National Forest, which is in the eastern part of the state, send me an image taken from a helicopter. Oh, it was during cool. one of the recent floods, and it was an image of an albino alligator hmm. hanging out in Croatan. So if any of you are interested in setting your cameras at Croatan National Forest, hopefully we'll get a picture of that albino alligator. He was big. That he would be really guy. neat to see on yeah. camera. Yeah, and it's, as Lexi said, you know, we don't usually get reptiles, but if he's been baking in the sun, mm -hmm. we could definitely get that. Definitely. That would be cool. So with the wrap of the winter season and spring just around the corner, um, almost literally we have it coming up at the end of this week, um, we will be uh, rem just reminding you to set your camera between March 1st and uh, 5th and you'll set those cameras and leave them out untouched for three week deployments. So um, once you have completed your online training, you can go um, call your library that you selected when you first signed up to participate in this project and let them know that you're ready to reserve a camera so they can put that camera on reserve for you and then let you know whether or not it's am am available immediately for pickup or if you need to wait a little bit. Um, the exception to this is if you're borrowing from the North Carolina State University's Natural Resources Library. Um, all Participants who have selected that library are automatically placed on a waiting list. We do have a lot of enthusiastic volunteers in our Triangle area, um, and so there is a bit of a wait for those cameras already. Um, so as soon as a camera is available, you will be notified via email that uh, you can pick one up. If you do um, are interested in bypassing that wait time, uh, you're always uh, pos it's possible to purchase a camera of your own and be able to run that as many times as you'd like. Um, there are several reasonably priced cameras that are on our approved models list, and so if you um, would like some more information about those camera models, you can find that out on our website or you can email me and I can give you some more information. Um, so once you have uh, collected your camera from the library, if you are borrowing one or if you own your own camera, uh, you will set that and then complete a site description form if you choose your own site. And just remember that you will complete a site description form for each camera site that you um, run your camera. And uh, each of those sites need to be at least a minimum of 200 meters away from a previous site. Um, 
And so that site description form can be found on, under the Volunteer Resources tab on our Candid Critters website. Um, and not only can that site form be found, but a lot of other really valuable resources can be found on that page. Uh, if you just need a few reminders about some of the information you learned on the training, that information is provided to you on this page, as well as if you're just interested in um, now that you've set your camera, you want to be reminded of when to pick it up, that scheduled deployment is on there as well. Um, and also, if you are interested in running your camera on a public land, so we've done some pre-selecting of sites across the state. If you want to um, place that camera on a game land or a state park, you can go to the resources, uh, volunteer resources page and choose that second option, which is the site selection map, and actually get to run your camera on public lands where you might not normally have um, access to. So once you have completed your deployment, you will, um, that camera will run for three weeks. You'll upload your images to the eMAML desktop application. Um, that deployment name is created to, for you based on the site description form um, that you have made. Um, and then uh, don't forget that we really want all of the images from your camera. So even if there are some blank sequences or maybe some sequences of your pet dog or cat, we want everything because in our eyes, all data is good data. Um, and once those images are uploaded, you are set. You can either decide to run another deployment or you can return your camera to the library. Um, so one final reminder is that we really, really want to know about your experience. So if you're taking pictures of yourself setting your camera or just pictures of the environment when you're out in the field, or if you come across some really great photos while you're uh, identifying them in the eMAML software, you can uh, post those on social media using the uh, hashtag Candid Critters. And we are going to combine those um, post and kind of create a, a, a blog of sorts to share those with all the entire Candy Critters community. That would be great. I'm looking forward to everyone's pictures on that. Yeah. That would be, be really fun. Well, thanks for those reminders, Lexi. We're going to continue with uh, some reminders, um, but this time based um, more specifically on the uh, set of the camera itself. Um, so the first thing that we want to remind you about with this is actually we really want to be sure that you are not using any bait with your cameras. Um, this is really important because we don't want to attract animals into the cameras. We want to have a picture of kind of the random movement of animals, how they naturally move through their environment. And if we put bait out in front of the camera, we lose the ability to capture that kind of natural movement because it's being um, affected by, by us. Um, and so we really ask that you not use bait, even though it's very tempting because you want really good animal pictures and you want lots of animals, um, but, uh, but it, it will disrupt the, the, uh, our ability to use the data that you collect for science, so we ask you not to do that. So the other things that we want to talk about are um, setting the camera parallel to the ground. Um, and so. This is something that we really stress in the training, um, but we just wanted to remind you about it before you go and set your next uh, deployment um, because it's so important. And the reason that it's important is if you don't set your camera parallel to the ground, it's really easy to miss species. You may miss the small species underneath your camera or close to your camera. You may also miss the big species far away from the camera, just depending on the slope of the ground. Um, and so to avoid that, we just make sure that those cameras are always parallel with the ground. The easiest way to do that is to just gather a stick from uh, you know, the base of the tree that you set the camera on or nearby. And uh, if, you're, if the slope of the ground is downhill, you put that stick behind uh, the camera, the back of the camera, sorry, the top of the camera uh, and the tree. And then if the slope is pointing uphill, you put that stick um, between the bottom of the camera and the tree. Um, and you might need to do some adjustments. So it often takes me quite a while to figure out the exact size of the stick to get that slope exactly right. And a good way to check that is to go and do your walk test. And if your detection distance is below, uh, I would say about eight to 10 meters, so if it's only six meters and it's a pretty clear area, then that means that most likely 
um, you have not got the camera exactly parallel with the ground. And so you'll want to make sure to go back and, again, do some trial and error and make sure that you, you do get it parallel and spend the time to do that. You'll definitely get end up getting more animals that way um, if you're really um, paying attention to that. So the next thing that we want to talk about is the height of the camera. So this is related to the camera being parallel to the ground. And the reason that we want to really standardize the height of the camera is, again, we don't want to miss the small species especially. So we're asking all of our volunteers to set their cameras at knee height. So if you take a look at this picture here, we've got, uh, this is actually Dr. Kays who's demonstrating this for you. He's the, um, the lead scientist on this project, and you'll actually meet him next week. I'll, I'll mention that again in a second. But he's demonstrating the right height to put the camera, and that's at his knee height. And it's really anyone's knee height, any adult knee height. They're all about the same. Um, but if you want to measure it more precisely, it's about two feet high. If you put it higher than that, um, and a, a lot of people like to do this or think that this is the right thing to do because they're concerned about missing the big species. But if you put it higher, then you'll actually miss the small species. If you put it at knee height, the detection um, from the front of the camera is actually in a cone shape. So pretty quickly out in front of the camera, it reaches fairly high to um, low to the ground and quite high to, say, the top of the antler rack on uh, a white-tailed deer. So at knee height, you'll actually get uh, quite a lot of the um, range in height of the animals and will capture everything from chipmunk size and up. But if you put it too high, then that detection cone is not going to reach the ground and you're going to miss the little guys, the chipmunks and uh, the squirrels. And, you know, as Lexi said, boy, are we probably all sick of looking at pictures of squirrels, <laughs> but we're still really interested in squirrels and we, we don't want to neglect anything. We want to be able to say something about the entire community of animals. But um, in that same vein, we really don't want to only target the small ones. So we also don't want to set uh, the camera too low. Um, so that knee height is the magic height. Um, and it is something that we have actually researched and we've done scientific research to see what the best height is to capture all of the animals in um, this community. And that's how we decided on, on knee height. We didn't just you know, randomly choose it, but, um, but there are reasons behind it. And so I just wanted to show you some uh, examples of what it looks like, how we can tell when we look at a picture that it's too high. I mean, it's really pretty simple. It's usually if we can't see the ground pretty close to the front of the camera, we know that the volunteer has either set that camera too high or that that camera is not parallel with the ground and that we're probably missing species. So this picture here is uh, an example of that. This is a pretty tricky set um, and it's kind of set on a slope and it looks as if um, it's either set too high on the tree or uh, it's not parallel with the ground because I can't see the ground at the base of that tree right in front of it. Um, and so we're missing, uh, you know, even I would say based on what I'm seeing there that you could probably have a gray fox or a raccoon run in front of that camera and you would never ever see it. Um, and the other thing that I mentioned about this one is that it is pointing directly at a tree that's quite close to it. And we want to try to avoid that if we can because although we can see the dog behind the tree there, if you have something small like, um, like a gray squirrel, you may miss it completely behind that tree. So in this example, um, this particular one is not on a slope, so it's nice and flat, which is good, but we can tell that it's set a little bit too high uh, because if you can see in the second frame, you see a squirrel there, but that squirrel, we really can only see it because it's sitting on top of a little log. If it were down on the ground level, we would have missed it probably at that level, and certainly if it were a little bit closer to the camera. Um, so we know this is just a little too high. Now there is always going to be a little blind spot right underneath the camera. The camera can't see underneath itself, and so it is always possible to miss little things. But if you've got it set at knee height, you'll probably, even if there's a squirrel right under that camera, you'll probably still, still see its tail waving um, you know, every, every couple frames in a sequence, and so we'll, we'll generally catch them that way. So again, you know, these are things that, um, that we really want you to when you're going out for that first deployment of the spring season to really make sure that you're paying attention to parallel with the ground and knee height. And you know, when you're first learning how to set your camera, 
um, and you're doing your first deployment, it can be tricky. I remember it, would be, it was definitely tricky Absolutely. for me to get it right. So that's really why we just want to go over some of these uh, reminders and show you some of these images so you can kind of get a better idea for your first few deployments um, to know that uh, there is a, a, a good way to set the camera um, and it eventually becomes very, very clear to you yeah. and easy. It's a learning curve. It's, it's definitely definite curve. a learning curve. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. As it was for all of us. Yes, like said. <laughs> it was. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, some of you have been submitting questions to okay. us, so thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to start from the top and work my way down. Um, it looks like we have a question from Don, and Don wants to know if a farm crop is considered bait. No, uh, no. I mean, if, if it's kind of growing um, uh, in a field, then no, that's fine. Yeah, you can put it on there. And, you know, what we'll do um, is we'll probably note that in our data that, you know, it's very obvious that there was, you know, corn or, or whatever is growing there. Um, and because that will act as an animal attractant, but that's okay. It's really what we want to avoid is kind of putting a camera out into a forest where there wouldn't be a crop, you know, or, or, or anything that would otherwise really attract the animals and sticking a pile of corn there because it, it's not something that they're used to, whereas they would be used to, supposedly they would be used to the agricultural field um, and, and, its, and its seasonal crops. Yeah. yeah, so that's fine. That makes sense. Um, and another really great question that we had come in was when you're looking at some night pictures, so the images are black and white, yeah. uh, how do you tell the difference between a gray fox and a red fox? Oh, that's a great question. That is an excellent question. So um, most of the foxes are nocturnal, so you're almost always going to have the problem of mm -hmm. gray uh, and red not showing up as gray and red. I'll, I would also mention that uh, gray foxes, even in the daytime, they have a lot of red in their coat, mm -hmm. and that really throws people That's off. That's a good note, um, yeah. yeah. they really do look quite red, some of them, um, during certain seasons. So the key way to tell the difference, there are two. The first thing is you want to pay attention to the tail. The gray fox has a black stripe down its tail. I wish we had a picture to I show. Do, yes. I, I don't know that we have a picture, but, um, but it has a black stripe down the back of its tail. A red fox does not, and the very tip of the red fox tail is white. Okay, so mm -hmm. pay attention to the tail. The other thing to pay attention to is the legs. The red fox will have black front legs, mm -hmm. and, it, and that black will go up quite a ways on their legs, and it's usually pretty easy to see um, in a black and white picture. A gray fox will not have any black on their legs. All of their legs will be the same color and a pretty light kind of grayish color. Right. Yeah. Do you think of any other keys for um, those guys? I think that those are probably the most reliable yeah. ways. Um, another thing that I was just reminded of was on that volunteer resources page, there is a um, uh, a guide, a field guide that we've created that has the most common species in North Carolina that can show you some of those camera trap images, so actual images that were taken by cameras. So it kind of helps you relate the, what you're seeing to something that's already been seen on cameras um, to, to help you identify those animals that can be a little bit trickier. Yeah, and they'll point out the key features. Um, and for some of you, depending on what region, what county you live in, you may have problems with squirrels. We do have fox squirrels, mm -hmm. um, and we have gray squirrels, and occasionally we have red squirrels, that would too, be something neat which to would see. be pretty cool. Yeah, we, we do have them in the state. Um, and then there are the rabbits. Um, mm -hmm. Lexi mentioned the marsh rabbit versus the cottontail rabbit. Those are really, really tricky species, which um, in the case of the rabbits, we'll even uh, we'll have trouble with right. those, yeah. Lexi and I it as well. It can be hard. Um, and so, you know, use that field guide. Um, that's definitely the, a, a good tool for you. Um, just looking through here. So glad we got so many questions today. That's great. Um, it looks like, are you supposed to check if the memory card is full at some point in the deployment and replace the card? I, That's a really good question. It's a great question. Typically, no. Um, and, you know, so sometimes that card will fill up. Usually that happens if we set the camera in, in a really high traffic area, which we definitely, um, would emphasize to try not to do and so high, by high traffic I mean you know a road or a hiking trail where you're gonna get you know hundreds of people or cars a day that memory card will will fill up pretty fast so if you're avoiding that those areas and you're kind of out in the middle of the woods 
and your camera is otherwise functioning normally, usually those memory cards will not even come close to filling up. The big exception is if you are, um, a, one, a volunteer mentioned an agricultural field, sometimes that can fill up the cards because on a, especially a hot day, and we have been getting some of those, um, those grasses or the lawn grasses will heat up in the sun and then if it gets really windy, you'll end up getting picture after picture after picture after picture of grass and it'll fill up your memory card. It's rare that that happens. Um, and so, in summary, <laughs> the answer to your question is no, you don't need to check it. But, it, you know, with the caveat that occasionally it will fill up, and that's okay. Um, you know, that's kind of, we'll use that to learn about that particular site. And you can let us know. You can email Lexi and say, you know, I set it up at this site. It only ended up capturing, um, you know, a week's worth of pictures instead of three weeks. And, uh, you know, so do you have any advice about that site? And we might be able to, you know, if you wanted to set a camera at a similar site, we might be able to give you some tips for, um, you know, avoiding that. As a general tip um, for areas that have tall grasses that may blow around a lot in the sun, I would recommend trying to, if you can, point the camera north. If you point it south facing or even directly east or west, you know, try and at least, you know, go off from east or west, then um, it, you won't have as, as much uh, problems with the sun warming it and then uh, blowing the grasses in that area. Great. And we have another question come in. Um, Sarah is thinking about placing her camera in her backyard. And a lot of people in um, our state are really uh, conscious about sustainability. And so they have a compost pile in their backyard. And so will that affect um, the animals or is that considered bait? Um, I, so what I would say for that is, is if you can, put the camera kind of as far away from those areas as you can. Uh, we do know that, that animals are attracted to compost piles. This is actually um, a part of a study that we are conducting. We're just finishing up now. Um, if you go to emammal.org, it's called the Raleigh Backyard Sustainability Study. And we specifically look at how animals use different features of, sus of sustainable yards like compost piles. Um, and so I would not put the camera right on the compost pile. In that fashion, it would more or less be considered as bait. Um, you know, not in the same way as dumping a pile of corn in the middle of the forest would be, but try and give it as much distance away from that um, compost pile as you can, but you can still put it in your yard. That's completely fine. And as part of your site description form, um, I believe we ask a question about uh, feeding. Mm -hmm. And you could write a note in there that says, well, I have a compost pile that I use regularly. Right, and then we can add that to the data later. Exactly just to keep a note. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I think that might be all the questions we have. Um, I know that you probably have more, um, and some of you can't watch this live. So if you do have questions later, please uh, feel free to add those to our Facebook yeah. page, or you can email me directly, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Um, but we are really excited for this second season yeah. of Candid Critters. And this is our first season that we go statewide. Right, this right? is our this first is season to go completely counties. statewide. We are lending cameras to all 100 counties, so we are very, very excited about it. Um, thank you so much for your interest in our project. I am looking forward to seeing all the images I can that you upload to us. Um, and and our that, next, yeah, so our next webinar is um, May 1st, and we will have a special guest, as I mentioned, um, Dr. Roland Case. He's the um, lead scientist on this project. He is a very very energetic guy. Um, he's very fun to, to kind of watch and interact with, so I encourage you all to, to uh, attend that webinar and feel free to ask him, you know, the, um, Dr. Kays is a, is a mammologist. He's an expert on mammals, so mm -hmm. um, he knows about all mammal species as far as I can tell yeah. worldwide. So That would be a great all time. All of your random um, mammal-related <laughs> exactly. questions that have been burning in your brains for, you know, years and years and years, this is your opportunity to ask them. So um, definitely join us then. I think that's it. Thank that's you so it. much. Thank you so much. Good night.